So this is the world into which uh, Margaret Zwartovin, uh, a water engineer, entered in 1990. And uh, she started her career in International Water Management Institute in 1990 as a water engineer. So what took place is a major transformation since then. And, and, and she was telling me that she is one who learns through experience. So not only is this personal experience important in her upbringing, I think also uh, in what she turned out to be, also the professional experience of working for many years in for International Water Management Institute. Last night I was thinking, oh God, how am I going to introduce this person whose work was so inspirational in my own uh, development as a researcher, you know, still to be under, you know, still rather underdeveloped, still to, you know, long way to go, but still she was very influent influential. So I Googled her, Margaret Zortovin, 25,000, you know, in Scholar Google comes up, uh, 25,000 hits. So that's Mar Margaret Zortovin for you. She is now in Wageningen University, another very masculine world of really hard-nosed water engineers. But then she continues to be a feminist and not just talk about gender, but she says we are feminists, you know, I'm putting forth a feminist perspective in water. And the, in, the, the reason why she is the conference keynote is, is a little bit of feminist politics here, as you can understand. In many water conferences, we, we got tired of seeing gender put in a corner, you know, just a session on gender, a book on water, uh, one chapter on gender, that covers it all. And, and then we talk about putting women at the center putting uh, of water sector, you know, the policymakers talk about that. But that never happens. So, you know, the streams of water knowledge that we have, uh, that I have alluded to earlier, feminist uh, scholarship is never placed at the center of that, uh, or at the forefront of that stream of knowledge, various streams of knowledge. And I hope Margaret Zortovin will, you know, what she has to say today will again make you all think and place that scholarship the forefront. So, welcome to you, Marjorie. Thank you, Kuntala. And that was an, a very appropriate quote because it's actually with the, the thing with which I want to start my uh, presentation. <coughs> I've called my presentation No More Heroes Anymore. And um, that's because I think that indeed those pioneering engineers that used to exist in the in the 19th and 20th century, they're no longer here. And I, I will argue that maybe that is a good thing, that maybe these kind of heroes always need to be treated with suspicion. <laughs> this is one of them. I think people from India will, will probably recognize them. He, this guy, he is uh, Sir Arthur Scott, he was a very famous irrigation engineer, a British irrigation engineer, and he still aspires a lot of admiration in Andhra Pradesh because of his uh, infrastructural designs. He actually was, he really helped taming some rivers, making water productive, and so he still revered. He, there's still statues like these at the intakes of the works that he constructed, and uh, so he is a, he is a great inspiring person. Um, he's, I think he is also one of the first who, who <coughs> launched the idea of connecting all India's rivers. That is still an idea that is still <coughs> very alive today. So this is one of the, one of the heroes. Another one is I'm from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands we also have these heroes. And there are many people who would agree that actually these heroes, these water engineers, have led the foundation for what the country is today. And if I think a couple of years ago we had a, a kind of um, uh, online contest of who is the biggest hero in the Netherlands, and some of them, some of these engineers, they actually scored very high. 
this, this is a statue of Cornelis Lely, is his name. He, this statue is placed at the beginning of the Afsluitdijk, which is the, a famous dike which was constructed to um, close off uh, a sea from the close off a sea and thus create a lake and the possibility to construct polders. So he is, the, the statue is there and big and for everyone to see and to admire and to remember. So this is indeed, I like Kuntle, the quote that Kuntle gave, these are, these are the big men that, that inspire admiration and, and awe, actually. This is what, this is what the, the icon of engineering. And I think many, I'm an engineer, and I think many engineers today still dream a little bit about being like this, about having the power and the control to actually redesign large stretches of, of, of land and of water to make this world into a better place. Because don't get me wrong, these were, these were in fact very nice people. These were, they, they really wanted to do good and they combined a sort of practical ingenuity with a, um, with a you could say, a Samaritanian need to, to really help and to do, to do good. And of course, that was also linked to moral superiority and patriarchal values and whatever, but they, they really, they were, they were nice people often. But what I want to do today with, with my presentation is to suggest that today we don't have these heroes anymore. Those big, nice, inspiring men that all of us look up to and that we can use as role models. And, and I think that is because the terms of water heroism have changed, are very different today than what they used to be. Also because water problems have really changed. They're very different from what they used to be. So solving those problems also requires very different kinds of knowledge and very different kinds of expertise and very different kinds of knowledge uh, of heroes. And what I'll, what I'll suggest is that for developing these new kinds of knowledge, feminist scholarship is very useful. There's some very interesting insights from feminist scholarship that can help, really help develop, developing these new kinds of knowledge that are necessary. What I'll do in the rest of my presentation is first I'll explain how water problems of today are very different from those of yesterday. And then I'll co continue with suggesting what kind of, how feminist scholarship can contribute to developing the new kind of knowledge that is necessary. So today's water problems, so how are they different? Well, in the, in the golden ages of engineering, in a way you could, see, you could say it was relatively easy because water was there to be made useful to humans. And the only thing that you needed to do was to, to, to invent infrastructure to, to actually make that happen. And water was, it seemed plenty, and it was often harmful because there were floods, etc. But it was, it was, so a lot of that was, a lot of, of water knowledge was about development and the construction of new projects. That's also why engineering figured so prominently, prominently in, in this knowledge. <coughs> Today, Water knowledge is really about how to save and conserve water and how to allocate it among competing users and users. It's also about how to control f uh, floods to protect people and other beings from floods and pollution. Water used to be considered as something that could be usefully captured for human uses. And today, it's really a worry about how to how to best allocate it, how to prior prioritize its allocation and distribution among, among users and uses. And this, of course, this change has, is associated with what many call the closure of river basins. What is also different from the golden ages of engineering is the almost, well, the general belief that uh, you could say in progress and development and the idea that science and engineering, the re most recent insights in science and engineering would help leading to ever increasing prosperity and wealth. 
Today, it's not, not so self-evident anymore what progress, modernity, development is all about. And it's also not so self-evident anymore what kind of science or how science contributes to this development. Doubts that are based on the realization that the Western world is and cannot be taken as the standard and model for the rest of the world, and on the awareness that Western development was and is achieved at the cost of mal, mal and underdevelopment <coughs> elsewhere. Wealth and poverty are connected by unequal terms of trade that are maintained through economic, political and military powers. For water, these doubts are importantly fueled by accounts of the high social and environmental costs of large water development projects. The Sarda Sarova Dam in India is, a, is an infamous example. The Three Gorges Dam in India is in China is another one. And of course, what has also happened is a, a very in, the uh, environmental concerns have really achieved a much higher prominence on water agendas. And these concerns are only heightened by climate change. These, these worries about the connections between development and water and the, the connections between uh, don't, do, are not local. They're increasingly global. This is just one example of a global connection that is of, of a, comes from a research project I'm involved in. It's about water that is actually taken from the high Andes. We just heard the presentation about water cultures in, close to Lima in the high Andes. And this is a, a project where what, this water is, through large infrastructural project, is taken from the Colca Valley to the, the, uh, the Peruvian desert. In the first instant, it was meant to, for mestizo farmers to, to uh, produce all kinds of agricultural crops. And now, actually, it's increasingly used by large agriculture, international agricultural companies who come in, appropriate the water and the land, and use it to produce asparagus, which are exported to the UK or to the Netherlands. Nobody in, the, in Peru eats asparagus. People don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's interesting that there's water that is taken from the high mountains in, in actually, you could say, so that really raises some very disturbing questions about how water should be managed and controlled. This is another example. It's an example of Levi's producing what they call waterless jeans. And I find it a very troubling example because what it also shows is that actually I, as a Western consumer, might have more possibilities to control what, uh, uh, how water is managed in a, in a specific place than the people actually affected by, by the use of that water. So that brings me also to the third way in which water problems of today have changed, which is that water development and management used to be considered the, the realm of the state. It was public. States were responsible for doing it. And today, um, partly because of privatization and other neoliberal reforms, and partly in, re in response to the uncertainty and complexity that characterizes water problems, many new actors have entered the water management scene. Private companies, civil society organizations. And like this example also, also shows, the skills and territory, territories of governance have also really changed with water uh, water control really being dispersed and globalizing. But many would say water is no longer just managed, but it's governed. And some, change, uh, change, uh, some associate the change, this change in terminology with uh, a shift to polycentricity, and others call it a shift, uh, um, label it as a deliberative turn in, in water management. Oh yeah, this is just another example which I wanted to share with you about how troubling or how, how much more difficult it is to link water, un water development to development more largely. This is an example of a research I'm doing in, uh, involved in, in Morocco. 
Morocco has a booming agriculture, and uh, many young people who used to migrate to, to France and to the Netherlands are now actually coming back or staying in Morocco to invest in agriculture. And so what you see, uh, this is a picture, you see an old man who is, who is an old fella, an old farmer. And he is dressed, you cannot see it on the picture, but he is dressed in one, one, one of the, those traditional dresses, Moroccan dresses. And next to him is his cousin, he's a young guy with a neatly shaven. And what you can see, what it shows, is that for this young guy, there is really, there is an, uh, a future and an identity in farming. Farming is no longer the, old, the, the dirty backward thing to do. Now you can actually be modern also as a farmer. And the, this young, this young men and others like him who tell me stories, their dreams about how they, they think of themselves as, uh, as modern farmers. And modern farmers means that they see themselves, picture themselves strolling in the souk with their operating their irrigation systems with their mobile phones. So it's, they don't even have to get their clothes wet, etc. They can be nicely dressed. So that is a, an interesting development, opening up new ways of being for young men, but also raises troubling questions about uses of water, about pollution, and about how these new identities are gendered. What does it mean for the women who, who experience this, this modernization? This is just an, a picture to illustrating a little bit the, how water is becoming more and more diversified with many more actors entering the scene. And it is a picture of a protest in Peru, in Yanacoche, where a large mining, gold mining company is not just only polluting the water, but also diverting water streams. So these people are protesting. <laughs> So all this to show and to illustrate how water problems of today are very different from those of yesterday. <coughs> mm. And what I think, at least what is my conclusion, uh, if I look at all these differences, is that water has really become much more water management and has become much more openly political. It's be, it has become much more clear that water is really about distribution, it's about allocation, it's not just about distribution act, uh, of water, but it's also about distributing technologies, about distributing um, public funds and, and money, it's about, so, ab about distributing decision-making power and authorities, etc. So it's, it's deeply, deeply political. Um, it's also political because it immediately ties in with visions of development and of ideologies, of, where, of ideas about the future, where should we go and where, where do we want to be. And of course it's political because it's, it's about how to organize uh, decision making and how to create accountability and transparency, which is very difficult when with, for instance, a water like less genes. Can you do it through, through corporate social responsibility mechanisms, for instance? Or how do you regulate water use and distribution? So water is really different. It's m much more pol political. And it's actually because of this, uh, that water, I, at least that's my reading of it, that water problems have become so openly political that I think that feminist scholarship can really contribute to developing new kinds of knowledge. Because, of course, feminist scholars have been at the forefront of showing how um, many pro how, how knowledge is itself is always political and of this entangling how things that, that we see as normal, as natural, are actually constructed and political. <coughs> oh yeah, and uh, the, the, there's, I'm not the, the only one uh, thinking about new ways of developing or new, the new water knowledge that is needed. There are many others and it engages with two larger debates in, in, that are going on. And one is the debate about, well, those of you working on climate change are very familiar with this, is the debate about, about adaptive management or integrative management, about wicked problems, etc. Uh, the realization that many of the problems, including water problems, that we're dealing with 
are not characterized by the by what is here in this um, lower the known. Eh? That is what science is based on. Is based on, on on ideas of causal relations of that cause and effect relations are repeatable, perceivable, predictable, etc. And but in fact, most of, most water problems happen are complex, which does also requires different kinds of knowledge. Um, the other development that is going on in thinking about new knowledges is um, the realization. Uh, how can I say it? The the fact that much now about knowledge is about process. It's about how to organize, the, uh, how to rationally organize dissent. The realization that there are many knowers and many knowledges. So my, I engage with these these two kinds of, of debates that are already going on. There's two two insights from feminist scholarship that I want to discuss with you. One is social natures, and actually I'm thrilled to be in an audience that is, that is buzzing with the, this co-production, social natures, co-evolution, Latour, whatever, and, uh, because normally I speak to, uh, I often speak to audiences of water professionals for whom this is <laughs> mind-dazzling. <laughs> so uh, for you, this will, this will not be new at all. And the second one is uh, situated knowledge. Let me start with social natures. Well, if there's one insight, basic insight, that informs feminist scholarship, it is that the distinction between men and women is not just natural, but importantly also, also social. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir's uh, phrase, on ne n'est pas femme, on ne dit rien, is of course, the, the most famous expression of this. Um, and that, wom that women are made not born, and that just as men are made not born, uh, not just reflects empirical di diversity, and this is just that one example. This is, a, an ex this is a picture of Sri Lanka women transplanting paddy seed seedlings. And I, I worked in Sri Lanka, and when I would ask people why is it women doing this, this work? And they would tell me, well, you know, this requires bending over. That is actually, that is only women can do that. That is very difficult. And it also requires this very tender dealing with these, these seedlings. You need small hands and you need to be very precise. So it's just women can do it. And then also you have to stand with your feet in the water all the time. And that's men cannot do that. <laughs> but then this is not even very far away from yes. Sri Lanka, this is Bangladesh and here it's men actually doing this very same task transplant, transplanting paddy seedlings and when I asked in Bangladesh why is it men doing this they would say well you have to bend over <laughs> <laughs> that is very difficult <laughs> and it's very hard work men, uh, men need to do it and also, you have to, to stand with your feet in the water, and that would be very bad for women because it could, it could uh, affect their health, and uh, it's very difficult. And then you have to do it in a very precise way. They have to be not need rows. <laughs> women would not be able to do that. <laughs> well, just, this, this is just one illustration. There are, there are, of course, many illustrations of how the, the gender difference, the differences between men and women that we tend to think of as natural are not natural at all. They're constructed, they're specific to time and to, to place. Um, so to theorize this, of course, uh, the, the, the term gender was, uh, in, was used, introduced, to differentiate between those differences between men and women that, that, are, that are natural, that, that was called sex, and then those that are not natural, that was called gender. And that was an interesting concept because it allowed, of course, for feminists, it allowed to, to engage in politics. Because if it's not natural, if it's a social construct, then you can question it. And then you can also change it. And that was convenient because that's precisely what feminists wanted to do. 
So in, on, in other words, the, the concept of gender allowed to shift questions of inequality and difference from the domain of the indisputable to the domain of the, what could be dis, di, debated and disputed. And what it theref therefore does, and what I like most about it, is that, that it allows questioning what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. Yet, the concept of gender also turned out to be problematic because it remained, this, this distinction between sex and gender remained based on, uh, on the idea that there is a distinction between nature and culture. And this is unsatisfactory because Sandra, as Sandra Harding said, people are not Cartesian minds that happen to be located in biological matter in motion. What, uh, so the critique of the concept was that actually this, it becomes very, if you really start thinking about it, it becomes very difficult to distinguish what is nature and what is culture. And when you really start thinking about it, you realize that you realize this co-evolution, that nature and culture are continuously co-evolving. And in, uh, in what I find very interesting in gender research, for instance, is the, the, the fact that uh, a lot of research about differences between men and women is based on research that has, is done in one uh, point in time. But actually, if you look at people, uh, people's um, evolution, from, if, if you would look at how they evolve from birth to, uh, to when they are 20 or 30, you see that, that there's constant, in, indeed there's co-evolution, something that is called plasticity, and that is also visible in, in brains. So it's, it's, then it becomes indeed very hard to say, okay, this is nature, this is, this is culture, because things continuously, the brains change according to the environment. So there's physical, uh, bodily adaptations to the cultural and social environment. So what all this shows is that this distinction between nature and culture is not a given. It doesn't reflect any really existing reality out there, but it is itself a cultural construction. And of course that also for, then forms part of what needs to be challenged and questioned as part of a feminist project. <coughs> Donna Haraway was one of the first who very eloquent, eloquently formulate, formulated these ideas. And what she says is rather than marking a cate categor categorically de determined pole, nature or women's body all too easily mean the saving core of reality distinguishable from the imp impositions of patriarchy, imperialism, capitalism, racism, history, language. That repression of the construction of the category nature can be and has that repression ha can be and has been both used by and against feminist efforts to theorize women's agency and status as social subjects. Um, and that is not, of course, this is an insight that is applicable much more widely than just to gender. It happens all the time. I was discussing with Jessica. <laughs> Yesterday, and she was. Uh, if you in discussions about indigenous people, the, the very same thing happens. Uh, you're either authentically indigenous or you're not. You're naturally indigenous. It has all to do with 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 uh, denominating things things as natural, authentic, and seeing them as ori uh, original rather than seeing them as effects. So it's it's the it's the um, confusing confounding effects with cause. Um, there are many words to express this, and, and these words, everybody here is using them. Donna Haraway introduced the word cyborg, nature, culture, to articulate this, that nature and culture are not discovered and that they co-evolve and co-produce. And this also, this questions the very ideas of, of of society and, and nature by showing that there's no essential difference between them prior to their interaction with each other. And one cannot be understood or even exist without the other. So the conceptual divide, what this means also is that this divide not just 
does not originate from any pre-existing reality, but is the, product, is the product of very particular ways of seeing and conceptualizing that belong to modernity. And in what the Donna Haraway also shows is that denominating something as either cultural or natural is, itself, is in itself a political act. Because again, if you say something is natural, then it's closed, you cannot discuss it anymore because it's natural. <laughs> if it's cultural, if it's social, if it's historical, then, then it becomes political and it can be debated. So it's very, uh, and of course that is something that uh, engineers always do and are very familiar with. They're very, um, and it's very, uh, it happens a lot in water. For instance, water scarcity is often depicted as a natural phenomenon. Which, make, which makes it apolitical, it's affecting all of us, etc. And the same happens to climate change. Um, and there is in, a very interesting analysis done to show how this works and how people actually strategically use, uh, or use this and denominate things as natural to avoid any responsibility or not to be blamed for their actions, etc. Karen, Buck, Karen Bucker's... Uh, famous study about the Yorkshire drought is, of course, one example. Another example is by a colleague of mine who did research in Mexico. And she showed how uh, drought in Mexico was born, not because suddenly the climate had become much drier or there was less rain, but because subsidies to farmers were, were, were stopped. So in, and farmers just so would, now suddenly were left to fend for themselves. And this was. Uh, expressed as a problem of drought. This is not to deny that there is an absolute or absolute or there is really drought or there is really floods, etc. It's just to say that the way we understand it is always through our minds and through our language. Of course, and as you all know, this, this, this idea of seeing nature and culture, nature and society as co-constituted is, is now very familiar. And it, it's, it can draw upon a, a growing body of, of environmental scholarship, that many of which takes inspiration from Haraway's work. There is um, uh, many words also that are used, the co-production thesis, hybrids, assemblages, social natures, quasi-objects, uh, for water terms proposed are waterscapes or hydro-social networks. Um, so I think I don't need to repeat this to this audience, <laughs> all of you understand this. Uh, what, what maybe is, inter is uh, good to emphasize here also, uh, at least something that I think is, is an implication of this way of thinking, is that it means that nature is always also social. And that has implications for knowing and for knowing water. Because it means that water talks back to you always. Suddenly water has a voice because water exists only through what we think about water and how we give meaning, how people give meanings to it. So that means, in another, to say it differently, that the object-subject split in that is part of positive knowledge suddenly disappears. And it means that really the meanings people, including scientists, give to water form, be, form part, start forming part of knowledge and are not separate from it. And I, well, there's some examples that I have. I think many, those of you who know the work of, or the work of Jamie Linton, who has shown how the, the, the concept of the hydrological cycle is not uh, just a representation of nature, but a very particular one that, that originated from in a, in a, at a very particular moment and for spe very specific aims. And of course, similar similar critical analysis have been done about propositions to use the river basin or the watershed as a natural domain for managing water, with people showing, well, these, these, the boundaries of watersheds and river basins are not natural at all. Because they're, and the definition of what it is is therefore always political. 
So this is this is the first insight that I would like to use, and, and I think it's a feminist insight that is very useful for water scholarship, for knowing water. This is just one example of the co-production, co-constitution. This is a, it's a picture of a paramo. A paramo is an Andean highland, and it's, a paramo is seen as a sponge. So a lot of the water that, is, uh, that people use downstream from these very high uh, wetlands comes from the paramo. And increasingly in, in, in today's discourses, the conservation of the paramo therefore becomes very important. And in these discourses, the paramo is presented as a natural landscape. It's nature. And, and people have to, have to either get out of there or be taught to conserve it. But actually, if you look at the, at the history of paramos, there, oh, sorry, I thought I had another picture. <laughs> if you look at the history of paramos, they're actually produced landscapes. They're very much produced because the alpaca herders who, who live here very actively modify, invest, do all kinds of things to, to uh, produce water, you could say. So th again, you see this also in a very, in a very material sense, how this co-production is, a, is a, an interesting way of looking at things. The, the second insight feminist insight I want to propose as contributing to new types of water knowledge is situated knowledge. Let me, uh, how will I do it? No, let me first say, well, of course, where I come from, I'm an engineer. I work among, I work a lot among uh, water experts and engineers. And, it, and of course, I've experienced it's often difficult to talk to them because their prevailing epistemological norm is positivist. So it, that is, it, it's based on the belief that reality does exist independent of whatever we say about it. And it's also based on the idea that reality should be discovered. And this, this process of discovery should happen by interchangeable knowers whose specificities of embodiment and subjective location disappear in the process. Adherence to this epistemological norm, which is of course linked to the possibility of transcendence, makes what much water knowledge speak as if from nowhere, from a godlike position. From the perspective of someone without interest and background, someone who benevolently represents the universal good or the universal truth, who is speaking on behalf of everybody or nobody. And of course, the, 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 the co-production thesis, the idea that society and nature mutually co-evolve, deeply challenges this epistemological norm. Because it says, well, knowledge and power, knowledge and meanings and, and situation are deeply inter intertwined. And science is not distinguishable or even in opposition to power and politics, but the two are very much, go very much together. Um, let me just give this example to show what this means. And this is an example, of, again, from the Yanacoche, a, a large gold mine company in Peru, in Casamarca. This is one, uh, how could you call it? Well, you can see what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, what it says is Yanacoche te contamina y asesina. So Yanacoche is polluting you and it kills you. It's tome um, conciencia, uh, become aware. That's what it means. Uh, this is uh, a slogan which is used by the environmental movement in, in Peru, which is a very strong movement and which has uh, many scientists that work for them to actually establish that this gold mine is polluting the water and is killing people. So it's... it's based on science. This is a, a billboard, billboard put up by the mining company, Yanacochi. It says, ¿Qué contamina realmente el agua? What does really pollute the water? And then it says, what really pollutes the water is people 
uh, throwing their their dirt in the in the river. La, mine la minería moderna no moderna no contamina. Eh? Modern mining doesn't pollute. <laughs> and then it says it's our it's all our responsibility to look after the water. So you see again also the political move of universalization. But you also but this also of course is you could say is based on science. These mining companies they have well the amount of money they have is just just incredible. So they, they are very careful also about keeping uh, about their reputation and they will do anything to be seen as and present themselves as as trustworthy and just to ba and just therefore base themselves on scientific facts. And then a third one. This is in English, so everybody can read it. It's uh, it's about um, the another the the, the mining Janakochi, who which has received a prize from the government of Peru for its smart water solutions and for its its what could you say its water stewardship? You could say. So the government of Peru was very. Uh, awarded a prize and said, well, because Yanacochi is so doing so well in protecting water sources and, and creating new infrastructure, etc. So it's another version of the same reality, this time of the government, also based on scientific facts. And what I just want to show with these three examples is that science can, you can, can make you believe anything, in a way. That's a simple way of saying it. And, um, and what this shows in terms of situated knowledge is that you cannot, science doesn't exist without the people who produce that science. You can only understand these claims to the truth by knowing who produced them. And you need to really know where do they come from, how were they produced, how were they manufactured, these facts on which these three accounts of reality uh, are based in order to be able to appreciate it. And that is precisely what, for instance, Donna Haraway and many others uh, <coughs> suggested. Um, they, they say, and Haraway said, well, science emerges from very specific places, from very specific people. It's not, it is situated, it's not universal or placeless, but it comes from people with identities, with people from, with particular values and interests. So to make this knowledge travel, eh, to make knowledge travel means to make others believe it. Actually, a lot of hard work is involved. It requires a lot of hard work. Eh, and a lot of the, that work is cultural and performative. It has to do, it has to do with package, packaging knowledge into words and languages in shapes and forms that are recognized, accepted, and attractive. <coughs> one, one such form is, for instance, if it's published in a, in a, in a good scientific journal, then it must be true. Mm -hmm. Another form is a conference like this. Yeah, that's a clear form, a clear cultural performative form of, of conveying knowledge. So this is a, this is, part of this idea of knowledge as situated. So in this way also, knowledge does not just present realities out there in the field. Knowledge also represents ourselves, or we use knowledge to represent ourselves. And, and for engineers, this, these ideas about uh, their positive, uh, positivist ideas about knowing it's also part of their of, of a cultural of a range of cultural resources they use to represent themselves, and not just to represent themselves, but also to distinguish themselves from and their knowledge, knowledge from that of others, from that of of lay people, indigenous people, social scientists, for instance, and to claim we are the real we do the real knowledge. I have a. This is actually a quiz. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, whom do you think of these people is a water engineer?
Any idea? Nobody has an idea? No idea whatsoever? Yeah? The upper left, this one? The woman? Yeah? Any other ideas? All of them? I think the woman wearing a suit. Oh yeah, the woman wearing a suit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're yeah. asking to, us to make a judgment out of context, so that we need a situated understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to show this. I, I just took these pictures from the internet. I don't know who is in, who, what these pe who these people are <laughs> and what they do. I just wanted to show this because I think many of us do have ideas about what a water expert, what a social scientist, what a farmer, what a should look like and behave. And of course, if you do, if you behave differently, if you look differently, if you talk differently, then you're discredited. <laughs> and that's the only thing I wanted to, to bring home to you is that, of course, looking at these immediately, all kinds of these, uh, in trying to think who is the real or here with the engineer, immediately we start sifting through our own images of what is a water expert, what is a etc. And then we know we don't need to want to be biased, so we'll, we'll say they're all etc. So, <laughs> but there are, those are very cultural things that happen, and that cultural things that, that um, are very important in the production of knowledge. Um, and what, is, what I find also very important is that in these uh, this cultural performative aspects of knowledge production, gender and ethnicity are very, very important. And um, water engineers, I think, at least water bureaucracies, we did a recent uh, um, study in, in South Asia, and we found that in water bureaucracies, around 90% of the people working there are, are men. And I think that is, that is probably true in much of the world. So water expertise in that sense is really tied up, definitions of what is good knowledge are tied up with definitions of what it means to be a man and a real man. It also means that if you're a woman and you want to become a water engineer, you have to do, you do have to do hard work. You have to do hard work, gender work. You have to show. You have to do both. You have to show that you are and a very good engineer, but at the same time still a real woman, because if you're not both of them, because the two don't seem to go together, that's what I want to show. So it's it's really, and it's also I think accepting that much knowledge is cultural, performative, also helps to, in a way you could say, reverse the research gaze. And to look at, for instance, water engineers as uh, an, an ethnic tribe, can I say it that way? <laughs> and do really, really nice, I think you could do really nice anthropological research about how engineers uh, perform culturally their rituals, their whatever, to, to make their knowledge credible and to legitimate, etc. And that is, there's very interesting research has been done. Uh, Ruth Oldenziel had, for instance, studied technology in the 20th century in the US. And what she found is that uh, a group, she, her book is called Making Technology Masculine. And what she shows is that through conscious efforts to positively distinguish themselves and gain status and respect as a professional group, mechanical and civil engineers during the late 19th centuries in the, in, the, in the US succeeded in delimiting the definition of technology as consisting of those activities they were doing. Mm -hmm. And all the other activities, for instance the activities, because technology used to be uh, crafts basically, but by, by changing the, slowly changing this definition, they succeeded in discrediting all other kinds of crafts, like the things women were involved in or black people were involved in. So I think that is a very <coughs> a good realization. Um, um, so, and what it, what it means for producing new water knowledges, new and better knowledge, I think is, it's like what you do when you 
it's may, it may be the metaphor is maybe you have to wear your clothes uh, inside out, uh, showing the seams and showing how, it, how they are produced and, and manufactured rather than trying to hide it, what is the, what is the usual norm in science. And instead show, oh, this is the way it was produced, this is, uh, this is where it comes from, which is, which is really different. And it is situated, this is me, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not universal, it's not, I'm, I'm not transcendent, but uh, I'm in this very place. And of course, yeah, so that is, I think, very useful also for, for new water knowledge. So, what does is, what is this, all this mean for... for knowing water. I think what it means is that the first thing that is the, the one I already said, it's, it's the learning about the importance of situatedness and partiality, that of course with situated, situatedness comes partiality, all knowledge is partial, and the ex becoming more explicit about how facts and truths are produced and by whom and for what purpose. It includes, therefore, serious efforts to be much more explicit about concepts, delimitations, theoretical assumptions, and awareness of how these, in fact, order, order what are realities, and, um, in, in fact, enact what are realities, and produce hierarchies. I think this recognition of, of situated knowledge counters dreams of generality and generalization and it relaxes the search for one most accurate and reliable account of water problems as very problematic. So, it, it, so what it also does with that is opening the door for many other kinds of knowledges and knowers. Diversifying the publics with whom experts should collaborate, redistrib redistributing environmental water expertise. And I think it should include very explicit efforts to to invite those who experience uh, changes in water flows and to, uh, as collaborators in any research projects and, uh, and ask them to interrogate environmental expertise. And thirdly, what these insights do for new water knowledge is they, they also of course, pose some very troubling questions, because if there are so many knowledges and so many knowers, how to bring those together? How to bring those together uh, so that water problems can actually be solved? Um, so, and I think what this means is that the process dimensions of producing knowledge become much more important. The rational organization of dissent, you could say. And, and of course, you see that already happening also in water. In climate change, you have the IPCC, which is just experts, but still you see there's many different knowledges in attempts to bring those together. What I feel, what my own feeling is that many of those attempts still rely on a, on a very optimistic uh, belief in the possibility of consensus. So what I think, what feminist scholarship also teaches us, I think, is that the production of knowledge will always remain controversial. So there will always be struggles, there will be disagreements, and there will be um, people uh, hating each other for what the other says. And I think that is, it's important to recognize that. Of course, you also need to resolve it, but it's also important to recognize it, that water is politics and it is, is, will, will be a, a, an area, a domain, and an object of struggle. Unless there are really burning questions, I would ask you to ask Marguerite to the last one. <coughs> yes, Zoe. I loved your talk. Thank you so much, Marguerite. And I just wanted to take up those two things on socio natures and situated knowledges. You know, I love the way it led, you know, the way you, you, your talk ends up like opening up the scene of epistemological diversity. 
and I just wanted to make a comment and, and ask your comments on, I feel we've got more progress happening on the socio-nature side than on the situated knowledge side. Because in the Anthropocene, it's getting more possible, even for the most hardcore positivist science people, to acknowledge that there is fuzzy boundaries between yeah, humans yeah, and natures. Yeah, yeah. However, I have not seen very much undermining of the intensely religious faith in positivism, especially in Australia, yeah. uh, in positivist sciences on the situated knowledge front. People are happy to concede knowledge is situated when we're talking about human and social science knowledges, but what we have not yet seen is um, very many uh, uh, engineers or scientists able to concede that their knowledge too is situated. Yeah, yeah. They, they are still believing in a Newtonian, yeah. a Cartesian, a Baconian notion of universal and positive knowledge. Yeah. A trend that I see has only been exacerbated yeah. since, by climate uh, change, by, 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 yeah. Yeah, by climate change, by the discourse of neoliberal economics, which, yeah. which yeah. is a sort of an external pressure that makes everything more and more positivist. And I've been thinking about this too, having spoken to water engineers and managers and so on, and and one of the things I reckon is that the engineering and science courses contain, at least in Australia, nothing about epistemology. People know nothing about history and philosophy of science or technology. And, and so how can they even start to think about knowledge being situated when for them there is, is only one sort of knowledge, yeah, the yeah, positive knowledge? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, have you got any thoughts about how we start making better progress on getting the positivists to at least recognise that they're in a paradigm, um, you know, not just the method or the knowledge, but how do we get them to recognise that they're in a paradigm, and from there, how you know a more epistemological, diverse point of view? I wonder if you, yeah, yeah, if you've had some thought, you've had yeah, some yeah, 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 yeah. What works? Well, it's interesting. I am teaching epistemology to engineering students. Oh, we'll come to uh, and and uh, <laughs> not many of them like it, actually, because <laughs> no, because many of them say, well, but I just want to to help solving things and yeah, build things and design things. Um, and at the same, time, I think what would be a useful uh, route to maybe make and I think many engineers, when you talk to them in private, are very much aware of, of the of the, what is it, the, the, the big gap that exists between the, the positivist ideals and what they're actually doing. Well, they will talk about what their wife or kids do as a way, as a... Yeah, way yeah. So I think yeah. what would be very interesting is, is have almost anthropological studies of what engineers are doing mm -hmm. and then confront them with this. Because in their, in their everyday working practice, what they're doing is not positivist. They, all the time no. they're negotiating, they're bargaining, they're etc. So, uh, so in that sense, it's, it's, very, it's, it's part of the ritual, it's part of their culture to, to continuously reiterate that they are positivist, that theirs is the only truth, etc. But at the same yeah, time, no. Yeah, they, I think they believe in it. It's partly, but... But their practices are very different. So I think it would be very interesting to study yeah. those practices and, and yeah, yeah. That's a really good question. I think it's a good team. It could be the starting point for another research project. But so we know. No, I would like to do that. It's very diff uh, difficult to get so, it funded, though. Yeah. Yeah. Please feel free to ask uh, any more questions to Margaret, and I hope that the lunch time will be quite an active one. Uh, is there another one question? Margaret? Uh, oh, yeah. Rosemary, sorry. Yes. Um, Maybe just following on from Joey's, um, this idea of wearing your clothes inside out and, and showing you know, how the truth is made, how the knowledge is made, etc. Um, and you said that that was a pathway through to then having acceptance of multiple knowledges, etc. I have a little a lurking fear that um, when um, <coughs> the way that scientific knowledge is, is made clearer, that that will only encourage uh, engineers and other positive sides to defend it more strongly. 
Um, while it's just accepted without any challenge that this is the truth, you don't have to go into a massive defence. It's yeah. only when somebody says, well, you conducted that way, so it's just your and opinion, not just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when they, they move into an even more conservative uh, yeah. position. Uh, that is that's, that's very true, and that, but that's not just true for engineers. That's true for anyone. Also true for family. Anyone who engages in politics, of course, there is there. It can be very strategic to either uh, take a very positivist stance or to take a, a very situated stance. So that that is where it also starts muddling. And so yes, you also have to think. Of, you, we always also in in a in a sort of. A strategic battlefield also when we produce not knowledge and, and the, the strategic effects of what we say and how we do it also need to be taken into account. But those are always, I think, very local. So those are very difficult to to give general answers to. Yeah. 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 And again, I think if we can gain from our personal experience largely from working in a very closely distorted organization. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. yeah. And just we can take the last question. Uh, thank you very much. It was very eloquent. Uh, you, I'm, in, I'm in complete agreement with you and you helped me kind of walk along this path. And we come to a lot of competing co-rationalities or competing interpretations. I'd like you to speak about the next step towards implementation because I, I feel that positivism and this kind of scientific approach is able to persist because an alternative is not very well Brutalized. Yeah. So, yeah. step beyond yeah. recognizing competing rationalities for us yeah. and tell us how we draw a boundary around it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, and it's not just difficult, it's also difficult because positivism is, is institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, we all live in the whole academia and, and, the, and the politics, it's all organized in, in around ideas of positivism. What I draw inspiration from for myself as, as possible ways out is it, again it has very much to do with practices. And it's related to the well to just to give an example to the to the picture I showed of Morocco. And actually there is a project on drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is seen by many uh, in the world as one important solution to the water crisis. Because drip irrigation allows you to grow more crop per crop. Uh, the project is really about seeing what is happening with drip irrigation in farmers' fields and with farmers and, and what it actually does. And what we find is that drip irrigation, the technology, does many different things to different people. What we also see is that there is not just one drip irrigation, there are many drip irrigations. So I, again, I think documenting this without, I mean, you don't even have to criticize uh, an epistemology, but you can just show diversity and show, and it's all, and it's something. Drip, the project is nice because drip irrigation is something positive. Everybody likes it, so everybody wants to talk about it. It's a success. <laughs> so it's not something. Oh, you're polluting like the Yanakoche project is in that sense very much more difficult. But this one, I and mean, what you see is is people at all levels. Um, what I call, and so what I call this is. Uh, I call it reflexive engineering. Because what you see is actually engineers but with farmers. Uh, I've visited welders who are redesigning systems uh, in their own little workshops. And so all kinds of material uh, things are happening and so around all kinds of social practices to, f to create new realities that have nothing to do with with uh, these high-flown ideas and they have nothing to do. So I, again, I think, oh, let's use those. Let's document them, let's use those to to engage really with what is going on in the field. Mm -hmm. But uh, changing all the all the positive institutional structures, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs>